first thing I want to do is say thank you very much to my co-authors for today. I've been very fortunate to work on um, a large project that worked on the sites of Vedravita and Nietzsche. Um, several different teams have done work on them and with the help of Slednik and Ivana, we tried to bring some of the results together. Um, and this paper is loosely based on some of the analysis they did when they did the dental microware of those two sites, now published in Anthropology, with some additional theoretical musings from me shaped round the outside. Um, so the aim of this session, and I was going to say this because I was speaking early on, um, is to think about cemeteries and inhumations um, in a little bit more depth and not take them for granted and begin to unpick some of the variation we see within the Neolithic in terms of inhumation. Um, and my contribution to the themes that we're discussing today is going to be about how we integrate bioarchaeological data with the funerary data. Um, and I um, see myself very much as a traditional archaeologist, or I did, and then I was very fortunate to work over the course of about a decade <coughs> since I finished my PhD on bioarchaeology projects. <coughs> and over that time, um, I've, I've made mistakes and we've had successes as well. And I, what I want to do is reflect a little bit about what I see as the biosocial process um, of, of analysis and, and, and to bring up some of the challenges and tensions maybe that we find when we're trying to combine basically what tells us about death, so the funerary practices, approaches to death, with the data, the bioarchaeology data, which tells us about <coughs> life. Um, and the ways in which we can think about those that, that contradiction. Actually, I've got that. Um, so, uh, just to sort of reiterate that we often study burial to find out about life rather than death, but um, uh, often it's we're asking questions about social organisation, and we do that a lot in the Neolithic. When we take a big assemblage of burials, we're interested in how those people are related to each other in terms of a particular structure. And in the context in which I work, there are different specific questions that we tend to ask. The first one tends to be about the kinds of variation in social practice that we see. Is this around a social structure that's egalitarian, or are we seeing various forms of inequality or hierarchy? And we also have ideas of insiders versus outsiders, cultural variation and cultural change, and how people have relationships across a wider area. And of course, this under, underlying all of this are big questions about the Mesolithic, Neolithic transition, in that we're trying to understand more about how these early farming societies settled down and became agriculturalists. Um, so I think we have to be aware when we're doing our research that there are underlying big scale questions that we're trying to answer, and sometimes we're doing them on quite small scale patterns. I don't think that's wrong necessarily, but I think we need to, it means we need to think carefully about how we move between those different scales. Not that I have any firm answers for those, if you do, let me know, but I think we need to be aware that we have those um, tensions in our data. But I think a lot of, um, it's important to kind of address these assumptions that we have because there are theoretical models which influence how we interpret the data. Um, and I think when we bring together bioarchaeological data with funerary data, we're making an assumption that funerary data tells us about the person in the grave. Um, and this sort of relates back to, rightly or wrongly, <coughs> ideas that come from the 70s. And I think I've picked on Binford here because he's an e easy person to point to. But this concept of social persona, whereby we see the grave as very much representing the grave goods and the burial practice as something, telling us something about that individual in the grave, as something that comes from their, their way of life. So we kind of use the bioarchaeology data to add information to that, to add information onto the grave goods, to add information onto the person in the grave. It's not necessarily wrong to do that, but I think we need to unpick some of the assumptions which come with that. Um, firstly, that it's a, the burial can sort of be seen as a package that comes together to tell you about the identity of that person, um, that we can make cross-cultural analogies based on economics, perhaps, that we can draw on anthropology in particular ways. Um, and underpinning everything we do is that the variation that we see in the graves is meaningful for the questions that we're trying to ask. And I just, I, I've kind of become aware of that very much as I've been doing my research and wanted to kind of lay it out as an observation that these are the kinds of assumptions that I'm trying to make. 
these are the kind of assumptions that I have to rely on in order to go forward with my analyses. So the biosocial approach then, if we're going to try and think about it in creative and uh, in creative ways, I think we acknowledge it's now commonplace. A lot of people are now trying to do this. We're trying to blend these two things together, but people are doing it in different ways. And I think it's most useful and most powerful when we begin to test that assumption between practices of death and life. So whether we begin to see patterns that we see in the bioarchaeological data repeated in the funerary data, and whether we see any correlations between the two. Um, and also where we try and use it to identify social groupings that perhaps wouldn't show up in the, in the funerary data. Um, perhaps to begin to unpick that package a little bit and see where there are perhaps multiple or conflicting identities coexisting within the burial record. Okay, so turning to my, my case studies, um, uh, they both come from the Linear Bank Ceramic, or the LBK. Um, this is the distribution of the LBK. It starts on the Great Hungarian Plain, about 5,500 BC, and spreads out in two phases. I think they look a little bit like dinosaurs, so the little dinosaur is the first phase, um, to about 5,300 5, BC, and then a second phase, um, reaching all the way from Ukraine all the way through to the Paris Basin. We see a lot of homogeneity across that distribution. It's largely thought um, to have spread due to migration, and the recent ADNA evidence seems to be confirming that. And then in terms of our existing social models, <coughs> there's been quite some debate over the last 20, 30 years, of the, or even 40 years, of the kind of um, social structures that we see in the LBK, whether it's roughly egalitarian, and that's been argued quite nicely from recent research coming out of the Paris Basin, or whether it's much more based around kin-based lineages and hierarchies, um, particularly coming from the funerary evidence itself that perhaps we have more inequality in structures as we go across the course of the LBK. So, so looking at the LBK burials in a little bit more detail, the sort of classic LBK burial rite as it's defined is an inhumation in a cemetery, though we find lots of variation. Um, the majority of burials are crouched, though we also find different, find different body positions, and on their left-hand side. And typically when we talk about um, the way in which grave goods are selected to go into individual graves, we see them as determined by age and sex. And I'd argue that's true for some grave goods, but not for all of them. For example, often you'll find pottery is supposed to be thought to be in female graves, but when I looked at all of the data from across the whole of the LBK, that didn't stand up as statistically significant. It's a slight tendency for more pottery in female graves, but it doesn't actually work when you look at the whole picture overall. But there's a, that kind of normal picture covers a lot of variation. Um, when we look at the kinds of practices um, and deviations that people have, they spread out across a whole range of different activities. Um, so we find burials on settlements as well as cemeteries. Um, we find disarticulated remains. We find them in enclosures. We find them in rubbish pits, sometimes considered to be disturbed earlier graves, um, but or perhaps not. Um, because we also find evidence of people re-entering graves. So this is where the anthropologist who's excavated it thinks that they've been moved and disturbed and the bones have been moved around more than um, bioturbation would allow. Um, so we have re possibly re-entering graves as well. Um, also skull caps are found, so people modifying um, skeletons to perhaps take objects for, I don't know, drinking the blood of your ancestors, perhaps not. Um, but definitely modifying bones in particular ways. Um, we also find cenotaph graves, um, sometimes in conditions where there are quite good bone preservation. So rather than it not being the bone that hasn't preserved, perhaps there was never intended to be a body in the first place. And then we also have mass burials and perhaps graves without noticeable ceremony, um, evidence of violence or violent activities where normal funerary rites haven't taken place after those deaths. So turning to the case studies themselves in more detail, this is the two, these are the two sites, Bedrovita and Mitra. Um, 
They're often grouped together because they're the largest cemeteries that we find in those areas. So Vedravita, if you include the second of burials, has about 110 burials, uh, whereas Nitra has something around 72 to 75, depending on preservation. Um, and uh, yeah, preservation and how you look at double graves. Um, radiocarbon dating has been carried out on both of the cemeteries. Uh, Vedravita was fairly successful and they managed to get a mod much better, more refined model out from the cemetery. And it seems to be slightly before Nitra, so it starts 5340 to 5230 and then ends about 510 to 590. So quite big spectrums but, um, and a long lived cemetery. In Nietzsche, unfortunately, the bones had been consolidated with PVC glue. And when we went and analysed the collagen, it had impregnated quite a lot of the collagen, so we were unable to radiocarbon date very many burials. Um, but I think we managed to get eight reliable radiocarbon dates out. They were then, of course, not the burials with pottery in or the ones that had any stratigraphy, um, as it's on law. But starting slightly later than Vedravita and ending um, probably around the same time. Um, in terms of the pottery, Nietzsche seems to be later than the earliest phase at Bedra Vita, and um, about 5,200 in this region, there's some big shift in the pottery and allegiances, so they, Bedra Vita probably falls either side of that, whereas Nietzsche is classically seen to start at that particular point. Um, so three projects have worked on these uh, two sites. The first one was the bioarchaeology project led by Marek Spellerville. Um, the next one was the LBK Lifeways project led by Alistair Whittle, and I was the postdoc on that project. Um, and then finally, there's work from uh, my colleagues, Zednik and Ivana, who have done the dental microwave. So um, the data that we had um, comes from the kind of data that gives us information about life and the kind of information about death, the kind of isotopes that you'd expect, and also dental wear, which is quite interesting to compare to the carbon and nitrogen because they have different chronologies. And the questions that we were asking, we decided to try and see whether we could see any correlations, so the straightforward correlations between the, the two sets of data, or whether we could see any groups or clusters within the data. So, to summarise, some very complex, very detailed evidence. Um, at Bedra Vita, the funerary data, um, females and children tend to be unfurnished more so than males. Um, we have this male association with polished stone and chip stone. Um, Spondylus is slightly more with women, but it's sort of a different quality. Men have less spondylus shells, but they tend to have more and bigger pieces. Um, grave goods are thought to increase with age, but when I looked at it in detail, they increased up to a certain point and then it began to drop off after the age of about 40. Um, and then there's really very little correlations between body positions, orientations and particular grave goods. There are no sort of packages of grave goods that might pick people out in particular ways. At Nitra, it's a very similar picture as well. So we have some very strong trends around males and polished stone, everything else, there's kind of hints here and there, but nothing as, as, as strong or as statistically significant. The spatial analysis similarly was quite uh, complex. Uh, previous work had identified separate groups that perhaps have different um, grave goods, but I find it quite hard to believe some of the groupings, for example, why is this grave in this group and not in that group? Um, and if you move the groups around, the, the pattern breaks down. Um, so, to summarise that, the key variations really that we have are male and polished stone tools, variation with age, and very little distinct clustering in the grave goods. We're not getting group sort of totems appearing as grave goods, we're getting things that are much more subtle than that. Okay, so to look at the isotope data very quickly, because I'm running out of time, um, basically for the um, isotope data, the main picture from the carbon and nitrogen is how clustered it is. So in comparison to other periods, the Neolithic LBK nitrogen, carbon and nitrogen data is incredibly clustered. People are eating very, very similar diets. And it's the same for Nietzsche as well. Very, very well clustered. These are the infants. 
for the strontium evidence, um, we find a lot more mobility at the early site of Vedra Vita than we do at Nitra. So it's seemingly this slightly earlier slide, there's a lot more variation in where people are coming from than we find at, at, at Nitra. On the whole, women seem to have more outside of the local rough, lo rough local range than men do. Um, and there's always one or four that turns up with low, <laughs> a low value that's harder to sort. So turning to uh, the work of Svegnik and Ivana, they looked at the <coughs> dental wear, which tells you about diet in the last few months of life. They look at the striations and the different uh, coarseness of the diets causes different patterns to be left. Generally, they, they confirmed what we see in the carbon and nitrogen evidence, which is that it's a mixed diet with meat for some individuals. So some people seem to have had higher nitrogen values, but it's not, it's not consistently um, across the whole population. Um, the diet is more abrasive when compared to modern examples, so it's a lot coarser. Um, overall, old adults had more abrasive diets, so perhaps they're eating more of um, the plants or, or meat. Um, men and women seem to be roughly eating the same diets, which confirms the carbon and nitrogen data, um, and there seems to be a slight change over time between Vedra Vita and Nitra, perhaps indicating a shift to more meat in the diet in later phases. Okay, so um, to kind of summarise a whole amount of analysis, we tried everything that we could, cor tried to put correlations between <coughs> every different of the different packages that we could. It's quite challenging to combine continuous and categorical data statistically. Um, but there are a few patterns that, that came out. On the whole, in this region, males had higher nitrogen values than females, suggesting that they were eating more meat. Um, that's not something we see across the whole of the LBK. It might just be particular to these particular sites. Um, at Nitra, there was a correlation between eating, having a higher delta-15 nitrogen value, so something that's come from the diet over the long term, <coughs> with dental wear showing higher meat intake. So maybe diet, we're seeing a very consistent diet is I think what this evidence is telling us. So we're seeing people eat, mostly eating similar things and that happening over the long term. So men with polished stone uh, axes were consistently local. They weren't the people that were moving around. I think in contrast to papers we saw earlier where perhaps the people who are from outside are considered to be the exotic ones. Here it seems to be the local people that have the biggest uh, grave goods. Uh, women more likely to move, fitting into the patch locale models. And men with higher um, nitrogen 15 had fully furnished graves. Well, kind of, sort of, um, sometimes. It's not statistically significant, but it's a trend towards that kind of more diet, more grave goods. So in conclusion, um, I wonder whether, because everyone's eating a very, very similar diet, those that do have a slight variation stand out more st statistically. So if you do have a slight variation from a very consistent population, you're going to stand out more than someone who's slightly variable from a population that already has a lot of variability. Um, gender and age factors do seem to influence what's going on, but only in particular ways, not consistently across all of the data. Um, and this leads me to conclude that we're seeing moments of gender uh, or age popping out in certain ways in the burial evidence. It's not someone's complete identity which is going into the grave. It's happening in subtle ways and in partial ways, not completely in the entire package. So just to end, I was going to, I've run out of time, but I was going to go back and pick up the idea of how we think about bioarchaeology along with um, funerary, funerary data. And I guess what I wanted to say is I don't think we're seeing um, a single package, we have to kind of look for the threads and work out where they cross over and where they don't in interpreting the data. Um, that we're not seeing in the bioarchaeology data necessarily identity, we're seeing practice and we're seeing the ways in which people are related to each other and the kind of community engagement that people, people have. Um, and, and so I guess where I'm going next with this research is therefore to think about the ways in which our bioarchaeology data tells us about connectedness and about kinship and how people were related, um, rather than thinking about their life, the individual life ways per se. Um, and I guess the next challenge 
therefore comes in thinking about how we can do that over refined time scales. Can we begin to look at these cemeteries with much more detail on the chronology to think about how these kinships were formed over time and how people passed things on to each other? Okay, thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry.